part here. Um, you showed that there are different possibilities for experimental realizations. I'm now thinking of the quasi-periodic structures and you showed a couple of images. My question would be, um, how much of this beautiful butter, uh, Hofstadter-like butterfly is actually left at the end in these experiments? How much of this fractal energy um, level uh, scheme do you see at the end? So, uh... Uh, for uh, the simplest one, the one uh, one dimensional ones on the first row, uh, you see quite beautiful uh, Hofstadter butterflies. And, uh, uh, and in, including uh, this uh, quasi periodic, so the, for, the, uh, for the incommensurate system. So the incommensurate system should look like this. And this is quite what you see uh, for, for, for these systems. As you go in two dimensions, uh, things become uh, more, uh, uh, the, the gaps overlap, the bands start to overlap. So some, uh, uh, so the way one does, you put down this, you are somewhat sure that some gaps will be uh, present. And then almost like a, like a, a rule, these gaps will be topological. So it, it's actually quite hard to produce non-topological gaps. And for example, for these systems, we had uh, three clear gaps and we chose the largest one. Uh, for this system, um, was not entirely uh, quasi-periodic. The theta was uh, chosen to be commensurate with 2 pi. And in that case, we saw, uh, in fact, uh, three, three clear gaps. So I should say, um, also in two dimensions, we can have quite nice, and you can, you can visually see the Hofstadter spectrum. So the console simulation does project this uh, Hofstadter uh, spectrum. But here the prediction was that even in one dimension you could you could uh, actually produce higher dimensional uh, uh, non-commutative torus, which means uh, we should see not uh, we should we even with one dimension we can create synthetic dimensions and we should see uh, more interesting butterflies. So exact, for example, the Hofstadter butterfly in six dimensions in principle can be generated with one dimensional systems, but uh, if you will do so, the gaps will be very small and uh, at the end of the day, you will need some tuning. So if I understand properly in all of these experiments, you need some sort of a control parameter to modify the geometry for each given a set of parameters, you measure the energy spectrum and then you generate this 2D plot. That's correct. Um, yeah. So um, it will be, so here uh, all these uh, parameters were uh, generated by, by hand. Uh, it will be very nice if uh, this uh, aperiodicity can be induced somehow uh, uh, naturally in the system, for example, by buckling or uh, uh, some other processes, which which you can you can generate a periodicity on demand by one phenomena will be just buckling a, um, a periodic structure, and of course the buckling doesn't have to be uh, commensurate with the periodicity, and that's impo that's important because uh, you would like to be able to modify this uh, theta fast and um, these are just demonstrations but if we want to make uh, embed this one in real world applications then we need a reconfigurability of this periodicity um, so uh, i maybe after this talk some people in the audience can think of uh, not 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 only buckling but for example even twisting the ends of uh, of a structure could uh, could induce a periodicity depending how so you you hold the ends of the structure and you twist 
uh, and that will readjust the couplings and of course um, uh, a periodicity could could be induced yeah thank you emil i'm looking onto my list i presently do not see any hand up but i suggest if you have a question just speak up and uh, ask emil uh, sebastian please yeah, uh, one thing, uh, great talk. One thing which uh, is uh, related to uh, uh, what Martin mentioned is that these are two seemingly uh, disconnected fields, but there is this guy. So you mentioned this guy, Jean Bélissard, and Jean Bélissard is, of course, really famous for uh, C star algebra, but also for quasi periodic uh, uh, Hamiltonians. So can you comment on that? Did he actually use uh, similar tools uh, in his papers on? Uh, you know, quasi-periodic uh, uh, spectrum problems and, uh, I mean... Yes, so... Uh, yes, his attention... Um, uh, so he has the seminal paper in 86. Yes. Uh, where he... But these were one-dimensional Hamiltonian problems with uh, quasi-periodic potential. No, he, uh, he actually, what he showed in that yeah. paper, if you have any arrangement of atoms, okay, in, including liquids or uh, there is a Thaisen space behind it. Okay. And there is a C star algebra behind it. And he gave a formal, a formal uh, expression of this algebra. So in other words, it's not, Every, every single pattern has a phase and space. And the fact that there is uh, this topological algebra behind any pattern, it's the start of the whole story. Now that's a quite a fundamental statement because we can be sure we can start a K-theory pro, uh, program because K-theory doesn't, doesn't live in an, in an empty space. It needs the C-star algebra behind. And the work that seminal work by Jean Belizard show that uh, any uh, pattern in fact has a phase and space and it has this sister algebra, which is computable. You just have to fill in the details, but it's computable. So then the program sort of um, focus on getting one class of patterns at one time. And quasi periodic patterns were the uh, simplest ones and then uh, uh, he focused on uh, quasi-crystals and uh, his program was precisely to compute the K-theory K groups and even in one dimension that uh, requires some uh, finesse, uh, they have uh, uh, results in two dimensions and three dimensions for these uh, K-theoretic groups and for uh, predictions for uh, the integrated density of states. Okay, okay, so also in 2D and 3D. So they also... Yes, 2D, the, oh, 2D, okay. and, 2D and 3D. And okay. uh, uh, you always get down to this non-commutative torus and it's a computation of this uh, theta, theta matrix. Uh, but then uh, more interesting, uh, you'd like to... Uh, there was nothing said about space groups. Uh, so that was uh, missing for uh, some some reason, and uh, space groups now come uh, into full uh, uh, full view. Uh, so um, that's where the, the sort of the field of topological electronic materials is now, and that was missing, uh, and. Like I was saying, you, you, now that you know this uh, principle, you can have two approaches, which is bottom up, which is somebody comes with you at you, to you with a, with a structure or with a pattern, and it says push, push through the, the program. That means calculate the C star algebra, K theory, make predictions, but you can also have the, the top the top bottom, where you start with the C star algebra, you generate a representation 
in a physical space. And through that representation, you generate your metamaterial. So then through this uh, top bottom uh, approach, in fact, you, the, 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 pers the pers opportunities are endless because you just open a, a book in sister algebra and you pick one and you generate new classes and new classes of uh, patterns. And that's actually how, uh, uh, where my uh, research is, uh, is going. So I'll, now I'm trying to pick up more exotic algebras and uh, see if I can really generate new dynamics. In fact, like, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And, and something else, uh, I, I think I already asked you this question uh, some, some while back. Uh, so is there a, a clear link between the cut and project method and this kind of quasi-periodic structure you generate through this, you know, uh, theta parameter? Yes. So um, it's, um, uh, if you take this, this uh, circle yes. and, and you make it in a, uh, in a parallelogram or you make it in a, uh, uh, in a rectangle, you immediately generate uh, 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 quasi-crystals. So what happens is uh, the, so this circle, once you made it in a, um, what, what will be a quasi-crystal? The quasi-crystal has finite, finite complexity. It means the distance between the points should only take a finite discrete values. <clears throat> So that's finite complexity. Here, the distance between the points take an infinite values, a continuum, a continuum uh, array of values. How, do, how can you generate a finite number of, uh, uh, well, you just deform this circle into some, uh, uh, some geometric uh, with, uh, with flat edges. And then you will see that every time you get to a corner of this edge, you are you are in trouble because coming from this side or from this side, uh, you generate different. Uh, uh, you can generate different patterns. So at the end, you will say that oh, if I if I modify this uh, circle in a triangle, for example, uh, topologically they are the same. But in fact, what happens? You have to take the corners of this triangle. And if you take out this uh, uh, corner of the triangles and you, you will have to put them back somehow, you will see that the phason, which here is uh, live in this nice circle, in fact, live on a contourized um, circle. So it's a circle from which you excluded a, um, uh, a dense set of, uh, of values. So for uh, for systems with finite complexity, the phasen in fact doesn't don't li doesn't live on a on a smooth manifold, but rather lives on these contourized manifolds, and therefore you cannot take uh, derivatives or uh, uh, so Chern numbers, for example, don't exist for for quasi crystals. <clears throat> uh, they exist only for. Uh, um, here, what's interesting is um, if this I, I change this uh, circle into a into a triangle, the K theory remains the same. Now, here you will say I can produce a Chern number using the physical dimension plus. Oh, sorry, uh, I cut you. Yes. So the K theory is not sensitive to the regularity of this uh, manifold. The fact that this manifold here it's infinity. And, it, and it's yes. not clearly when you have, it's not sensitive to this. So it's it not, this. yeah, that's right. So it's not sensitive to that. And uh, what else? Uh, the spectrum, on the other hand, will be quite sensitive. If you, if you go from a smooth, uh, smooth phase and space to a, to a non-smooth space. Let's look at, uh, at this one. If you try to jump from any of these gaps to the other gap, you will cross spectrum. 
But if, if I will change this one into a triangle, this will actually disappear. Uh, you, could, you could, in principle, jump from, uh, uh, from any gap to any gap without crossing the spectrum. I see. And uh, uh, that's, that thing is, uh, uh, is not prohibited by the K-theory. It's simply a, uh, a manifestation that the fact that the Chur number doesn't exist uh, um, in one case and for the other. That's, that's so, so, it, so it's very simple. You you just take the, this smooth manifold and make it into a flat. You produce uh, uh, you produce finite complex, finitely complex structures, and you get uh, the quasi crystal. Mm -hmm. so, thanks a lot. This is really helpful. Thanks. Oh hi, I mean. Can I ask you that what's the difference between the C star algebra and the, the Kirchhoff algebra? And the Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff. Uh, Kirchhoff. Uh, Kirchhoff. Yeah. Hi, Shui. Hi, Shui. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I saw they use the Kirchhoff algebra to do the classification of the of the topological matter. They, uh, yeah, in, in uh, my talk, the Clifford algebra. Yeah, that's uh, a, that's a in, in this, uh, at this level. But I will not, uh, well, some, uh, um, so the Clifford algebra is used when, when, when uh, people uh, uh, classify Dirac, Dirac operators. Now the Dirac, so the Dirac operators appear as uh, for, because of these uh, conical singularities in the in the boundary spectrum, and then uh, you would like to classify how many of these uh, conical singularity there are, and then it, there is where the the Clifford algebra uh, becomes useful. Okay. But here. Uh, here we go a little bit. Uh, uh, so the big point that I would like to say is that uh, if if you are given a, a pattern of uh, of uh, resonators, you should be able you should be absolutely sure there is a sister algebra behind it. If you have another pattern that pattern will also have a sister algebra behind it. If the two sister algebra coincide, you are talking about the same, same dynamics. Whatever dynamical patterns you find in one, in one uh, metamaterial, you'll find it in the other. Uh, therefore, uh, there is no point in, uh, in studying two of them, but just one. And if you write, for example, an NSF grant saying that we will discover new dynamical patterns. Here we have a criterion, a rigorous criterion. If you claim that you discover a new dynamical pattern, then you have to demonstrate that the algebra of these dynamical matrices for the system you, you made the claim has an algebra which is not isomorphic with any other algebras that are already known. So uh, here is when we write a grant, we say, well, uh, I can show you that this dynamical pattern that we found, we excited from a, from a um, band projection. Well, this band projection cannot be continuously deformed into any other projection, any other band projection of any other metamaterial which was studied before. How can you, how can you say that? Yeah. Well, algebras are non-isomorphic um, and so on. So this, uh, like uh, Martin said, if we only look at the topological aspects, actually the topology gives us something more. It gives us really a way to conceptually identify or uh, make the distinction between different dynamical patterns. 
and the criteria is very 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 simple you excite the, the dynamics then you adiabatically change the system and if you can change the system one into another continuously so that one pattern becomes the other then they should be basically the same conceptually the same and then k theory assures us that uh, if you excite that pattern from a band projection uh, here and another band projection here if the two belong to the same sister algebra and they have these k theoretic labels no matter what you excite from this band projection you can find you can excite it from the other band projection therefore physically your structure can be looked very differently while <clears throat> you can easily demonstrate that they have equivalent dynamics yeah, yeah. Uh, okay i have another question um, uh, what's the meaning of the python um i think in condensed metaphysics they use python to describe the um, discrete uh, motion or the rearrangement re 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 of the lattice. Yeah, so <clears throat> let's uh, uh, so let's look at this pattern yeah. and imagine <clears throat> that uh, this uh, this pattern is actually cooked up in a furnace or something like that. And we start we start we can start the algorithm from this point, but very well I could start it from this point or from this point or from this point. Now you calculate how much energy do I need to generate this pattern? And you'll say, well, it depends on where I started because the pattern certainly looks different if I started from here, if I start from here. But guess what? It's the same energy. Because if you shift the pattern left and right, you actually can, if, you, if I bring this point here, then it's the same as starting the pattern from this point. If I bring this point here, it's the same. So in other words, by shifting the patterns back and forth, I can sample the circle densely. And we know that shifting a pattern in empty space doesn't cost energy. So the phason, can be defined as the complete degree of freedom of a pattern, which uh, the phasan space is the zero energy of the pattern. <clears throat> so it takes zero energy to, uh, to produce this pattern again. Okay, okay, I see. <clears throat> Thank you. And yeah. uh, yes. <clears throat> I see at the moment no hands up. Please raise your hand or just start speaking if you have another question. Okay, go Leon. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the talk. Really nice. We enjoyed it. Uh, my question is: so can you use this 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 IDS this invariant to understand the? So the topological protection and, and hence the, the robustness of, of modes that you might create with defects in these gaps. Uh, okay, very, very good uh, uh, question. So let me say that this uh, IDS um, is well defined if the metamaterial is uh, what we call homogeneous, that the trace per volume is well defined. Uh, that's actually quite physical. Trace per volume, every intensive thermodynamic uh, quantity is calculated through a trace per volume. So every time when thermodynamic limit exists, you can be sure that uh, IDS is well defined. Now, in principle, uh, a, a band or a, a, a gap which carries uh, uh, different topological labels and we've seen that IDS provides a very convenient way to um, to, to calculate this um, so through this uh, kind of fittings you can calculate the 
you can calculate the topological labels, so you can calculate these NJs. And if you have systems, uh, if you make an interface which, uh, with systems which have different values of this NJ, you could expect to have <coughs> topological uh, interface modes. In fact, if <coughs> the transition is made smooth, you can be sure that there will always be interface modes uh, when you have um, when you put together uh, a gap with uh, uh, one set of labels and another set of labels. So that can be you can be sure that there will be interface mode if the transition is uh, smooth. However, in the bull boundary correspondence, always the transition is uh, <clears throat> we want the transition to be sharp, so we must want to have a sharp interface, and that's not always. Um, the case. So only a um, certain set of gap indices will, uh, will, will produce uh, these uh, interface modes which uh, exist at sharp interfaces. And it's, it's easy to understand, for example, from in three dimensions. In three dimensions, if we have we have chair numbers, but we have chair numbers only on, on different planes. So for example, we, we can have a whole, whole conductance, quantized whole conductance in the XZ plane, but not in the XY plane. Then the interface must happen so that it engages that plane. And if the interface will happen without engaging that plane, without cutting that plane, then uh, there will be uh, there will be no edge modes concentrated at sharp uh, at sharp interfaces, but there will be edge modes uh, if uh, the transition. I mean, the interface is smooth. Okay, thanks. It's very interesting. So, in the, in the setting of these resonators positioned on some kind of lattice, well, what does it mean to have the transition be smooth? It means you got you, you okay. So I guess you've got you've got two crystals and you're slowly morphing between the two of them. Is that yeah, that's right? Yeah. Slowly morph the uh, on the paper, and if you want to be rigorous, it will be it should be infinitely smooth. Mm. So uh, mm. while uh, okay, in practice, for example, if you have ten layers, if you this uh, smooth transition happen across ten layers, then you you will already see it. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Interesting. So I see no hands up at the moment. I'll give you another second. We had a good half hour of questions to Emil anyway. Um, so I suggest uh, we thank Professor Emil Podan once again for this very nice talk. Thank you. And I now hand over to Sebastian Gno.